Hello, my name is Guy Caruso, and I work for the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University. It's my pleasure um, to talk about another of the SRV, Social Role Validation, themes today, and what we're calling Model Coherency, How Does Your Post-Secondary Initiative Meet Students' Needs and Fit Together? I'll be talking to you about how to develop, as well as examine an existing initiative for students with intellectual disabilities in post-secondary inclusive higher education, and whether the initiative meets the needs of the students. I'll talk about three major topics in this presentation. First, the concepts of relevance and potency. Second, what did Wolfensberger mean by the term model, then describe some models for you. And third, what did he mean by model coherency and why this idea is so important to your inclusive higher education initiatives? Well, for inclusive higher education initiatives to be of high quality, they need to be relevant and potent. And by relevance, that means what do re recipients, students, need? What do they need more than other things? And are they getting it? And then potency, what are the most powerful ways of delivering the content that you have in, in your initiative? So what do we mean by relevance? By relevance uh, or relevant uh, initiatives need to take the time to ask, do recipients, students, you know, what do they need? And what do they need more than other things? So for example, remembering the concept of the culturally valued analog, the CVA, you'd ask, what would a typical matriculating student need when they attend college or university? Certainly, play and entertainment might be a need. However, a more pressing need is academic, course of study, knowledge in a particular field that will prepare a student for work and a meaningful career. And colleges and universities track students and keep st statistics on dropouts, non-graduating students, and ask themselves, why this occurs and are they meeting the needs of the students? Equally, are students getting employment out of college? Are the courses, internships, academics such that employers hire their students? If students' needs are not being met, students will likely not attend and switch colleges to better meet their needs. The curriculum of a college university is crucial to meet the needs of students as are various opportunities to do things, attend events, live on campus. Now let's talk about potency. We know that whatever processes that are employed should be the most effective and efficient means for addressing a student's needs so that one makes the best use of the time of the students and not waste their time. For example, students with disabilities should have relevant classes the same intensity as other students so their, their time is not wasted. Now it's one thing to make the content relevant, but to make the content potent is to effectively engage students in a way that will instill in them a sense of importance and self-worth. We know that for many people with disabilities, people have held low expectations for them their whole lives, resulting in them having low self-esteem and self-worth. Um, when faculty, others expect the best, place high expectations upon a student, and challenge a student constructively, then that is a potent program. Now, a college university could be relevant in meeting students' needs, and do less in a potent manner. For example, internships are relevant to all students. I know my three sons, their internships is what really led to them getting jobs after college. For students with disabilities, if they only get one day a week in their senior year for an internship, but all other students, other, all other matriculating students get three days a week, then that's not a potent program. We've watered it down. So internships are relevant. We know that. That's how you get a job oftentimes. But the potency would be how often do you have that internship? Is it really going to maximize your opportunities and really push you to get ready for the world of work? Now, the second part of this presentation is to talk about and define human service models. Now, human service models are combinations of assumptions, contents, and processes. Now, assumptions are the underlying premises, beliefs, ideologies, whether conscious or not, on which the model is based. Now, models of service could assume or believe students with disabilities are incapable of learning, will never have friends, will never work. They could believe people with disabilities are more like children than adults, need to be pitied and offer charity. One assumption could be that people with disabilities are just like everybody else and should be a accorded a life like anyone else, with the same opportunities and expectations, what we have talked about when we discussed the culturally valued analog previously. Now, content refers to what the service model actually delivers. What does it convey to students? What does a student get at university? The what. Now, process refers to the means by which content is conveyed, 
the how. So when we speak about model coherency, we're asking four main questions. First, who are the people to be served? Second, what do they need? Third, and how should that need be delivered using what methods and technologies, in what settings, and what kinds of groupings, by what servers? And how should all this be talked about, the fourth point, um, when we're talking about the model? Now, one way to visualize the four components we just discussed is in these three circles. The top circle, who, describes the people, their ages, their gender, their needs, and most pressing needs. The second below circle, what is the content? So what are the students actually getting? You know, is it education? Is it work? Is it medical care? Is it food? Is it nutrition? And then the third circle, the how, the process including grouping composition. Are they getting the how only with other students with disabilities? What's the size of the group? Is it 30 people? Is it 150 people? The who, um, you know, who the staff? Uh, is it faculty? Is it others? Um, where is the content provided? On campus, off campus, combination of both? And then the language used to describe all of this you know, is, is what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, what a model would be. Now the arrows on the side um, uh, of this image shows the coherency between the three circles, coherency between the, the who, the what, and the how. So you have the arrows sort of encircling that, hooking those together uh, as they match. They're coherent. Now the assumptions around each circle are what people's beliefs are about the people, the, the context and, and, the, and the process. The assumptions around each circle are what people's beliefs are about the people, the content and the process. Assumptions can see people with disabilities like us, with a need for supports when necessary, or not like us, needing special care, special treatment, special settings, special groups, and special staff. Now, here are some typical major models which may be encountered in human services. Some of these you are familiar with. For example, the medical model, number one, and or the commercial and industrial model, number four. As we experience these when we're a patient in a hospital medical setting, or at our workplace as an employer or employee. Now, we have all been part of the developmental model, number five, all through our school years um, and even before when our parents, I mean, their major goal in life was to help us to grow and to learn and to do things. So that's all about the developmental model. One to five on this image are models that are positive in nature. Sometimes we might not be conscious of the models uh, of service, such as number six, pity and charity. Um, there are programs you know, set up that really are based on pity and charity, that feel sorry for people, that pat them on the head, that don't have high expectations. Uh, number seven, the holy innocent model. Oftentimes that's more of a religious, spiritual model that sees people with disabilities in sort of a, a special light, being able to do no wrong. And then we have number eight, the military uh, discipline model, which can be positive and negative. Obviously, it's a model used you know, in the military, but when it's used on people with disabilities, oftentimes it has really negative consequences and it's about you know, discipline and really controlling people to a great degree. Number nine is the menace detentive model. Oftentimes we see this in prisons and jails where the model really is about punishment and it's in, in seeing people as menaces who need punishment. Number 10, the subhuman animal model. I unfortunately experienced this early in my career when I worked in institutions, when people with disabilities were seen as if they were animals and so treated. Number 11, the deaf socialization model. Again, you know, we don't consciously think of this, but there are services set up, nursing homes, hospices, that really are about people dying. I mean, that's what they do. So these are the, the various models that exist, some that you're familiar with, some that are very conscious, others that aren't so conscious, and we really want to focus on um, the five positive models when we think about serving people with disabilities. Now, here's an example of the medical model. Now, again, we're gonna, going to look at the four points we discussed earlier. So you're going to ask yourself, who are the people to be served? So obviously, in the medical model, it's people who are sick, who are ill, who are hurt. What do they need? They need medical care. They need medicine. They need health. You know, how should all this be delivered? So when we look at the methodologies and the technologies, you're going to get therapies, you're going to get medicines, you're going to get surgery, you're going to get treatment. That's all part of what you expect when you go to a medical model. Where does this occur? In what settings? Well, in hospitals, medical settings, and clinics. And what type of groupings? Well, oftentimes the groupings are more one-to-one, -one, 
but you might be grouped with people who have your same diagnosis, your same uh, illness. You might, that's who you might be grouped with on a hospital floor or on a unit. Who's doing the service? Who are the servers? Well, typically in the medical model, it's going to be nurses, therapists, doctors, specialists, clinicians. And then the language of the medical model we're very familiar with because we use the words doctor, patient, dosages of medicine, treatment plans. I mean, that's all the language that you expect to hear in the medical model. And all that holds together to create that concept of a medical model. Now let's have an example of the developmental model. Now again, who would be served in that model? Okay, it would be students uh, needing to grow, to learn, to become competent, to become employed. What do they need? Education, learning, opportunity. Uh, how should this all be received? What methods and technologies? Well, it's going to happen in classes, internships, on the job. Where? The settings? College, universities, trade school. What kind of groupings? Typically, you're, you're with other age peers when you're going through these processes. And by what servers? Teachers, educators, mentors. And the language you know, of, of this model is really going to be that of growth, of learning, of success, of progress, grades, students, teachers. So again, we hear this all through our school years, all through our college years. You know, that's the developmental model. Now, we can look at the Millersville University's Integrated Studies Initiative as an example of a modally coherent program. So when we start looking at this, and when you look at the who, the, the, the top circle, you're going to see, so who's being served? Well, students with intellectual disabilities was the determination. That's what they decided to serve. The ages will be typically college ages, 18 to 21 or so. They decided to serve men and women who both go to college. They're able to pay. That's one of the deals about going to college. You've got to find a way to pay for it. Um, they want to attend. People don't go to college if they don't want to attend typically, okay? Uh, and they can be out-of-towners or they can be in town. What are they receiving? The content. Well, they're receiving what they're interested in, their area of study, whether that's history, the arts, uh, music, whatever it happens to be. That's the content they're going to get. They're going to get social opportunities and chances to join clubs and intramural sports and other social activities on campus, maybe even a fraternity or a sorority. They're going to have residential life. They're going to live in a dorm with other students. That's what you do in college. You get to select a roommate oftentimes, at least have an opportunity to do that. And oftentimes in college and university, and particularly at Millersville, you're going to get work opportunities on campus during your four years of college but also internship opportunities that increase over the years so that, again, you're prepared for the world of work. And how does all this happen? What's the process? Well, you have lessons. You know, faculty uh, have lesson plans, and they have uh, course descriptions, and they have certain work that you need to do. You're probably using computers because that's how we do things. You're going to be in classes uh, taking uh, things, in labs sometimes even, for some of your courses. You're going to be grouped with other students who have an interest in that particular topic area just like you. You're going to be taught by faculty and maybe by tutors um, and even receiving tutoring help at the uh, tutoring center on campus. The language is going to be the academic la language that you hear at a university and it's going to be on campus. That's where these things take place. Now this program is relevant at Millersville but it's also potent as well and it follows when you look at the assumptions around the outside of each of these circles, the assumptions are the culturally valued analog, that students with intellectual disabilities should have the same opportunities and be treated just like any other matriculating student. Now let's examine a model incoherent university program for students with intellectual disabilities. So if we look at the, the top circle um, on the image, who the people at an incoherent university program for students with intellectual disabilities Obviously, students with ID are going to be the people being served with intellectual disabilities. The age range in this program is between 18 and 50. That's a broad age range to be going off to college. Men and women um, able to pay. Obviously, for anybody going to college, that's going to be a crucial aspect of who the people are. Here we have the parent really decides about the child going to college. It's their need, not necessarily the need of the student. So the parent, this program is more geared to the parents' needs than students' needs. Um, and it's local students attending. Now we think about, so what do the students get? What's the content? Well, for many incoherent programs, it's prepared, packaged programming that's done. Students aren't choosing their courses, not choosing their field of study, but there's already a decided upon field of study 
uh, a packaged program for students with intellectual disabilities. There's a few opportunities to socialize, and if they are social, able to socialize, it might only be with other students with disabilities. Um, there's residential options, but it's only with other students with disabilities. So you're in the special dorm. You're, you're in the disabled dorm. And you don't get work opportunities here. What the content is, you get volunteer opportunities. We start looking at the third circle, the how, the processes. Well, in this incoherent program, we're really look, looking at keeping the individual educational plans for students like they had in high school and grade school. We continue that process. They might be using computers. You would hope that would be the case. Their classes, though, are separate. They're separate from the other students on campus, and they're just with other students with disabilities. Uh, so they're only grouped with people like them. Um, they're taught by non-faculty. Again, that's the how, not by faculty uh, or, or staff on campus, but by other people. Um, they're sort of the language used in this program is a special education language. It's not a university language. Okay? And it might even be off campus. There might be a house they have off campus that they're using so close and yet so far. And the assumptions around the outside of each one of these, the assumptions here are these aren't matriculating students. These aren't like regular students. These are students with disabilities who need to be pitied in charity, perhaps, who aren't as uh, adept or uh, competent. And so the, the assumptions are different, therefore meaning that the who, the what, the how equally are viewed differently. And this is why a program like this would be incoherent. So simply said regarding model coherency, you've got to have the right servers should be using the right materials, methods, and language in the right settings in order to do the right thing for the right recipients who are grouped in the right way. All that's got to hold together. It's all got to be coherent in how it holds together. This is why Wolfensberger came up with the concept of model coherency. As we bring this presentation to a close, here are three questions to ask yourself. Does your inclusive higher education initiative hold together? Is it model coherent? If not model coherent, what can you do to make it more coherent? For example, if your students are graduating and they have a special graduation, is that model coherent? Is that what you would expect of typical matriculating students? And if it's not, do something about it. Okay? So for an example, Temple University's Leadership and Career Studies program for its first eight years of existence, had a special graduation. You know, it was wonderful for the students. The parents came in, it was quite nice. But they start to really think hard, the leadership of that program, about how can we make it modally coherent, like it would be for any other matriculating student. So just this year, 2021, the students in the Leadership and Career Studies program marched with all the other students in full regalia, got on stage, received their certificates, were announced just like everybody else. So it took eight years, but we really were questioning how do we make this more like what it would be like for a typical matriculating student. Ask yourself if you're applying the culture VA analog to students who are matriculating to students with disabilities. The CVA says we need to address the needs of students with disabilities in our college university by the same means that we do for students who are matriculating. It's very simple. So if you keep to the CVA, particularly when you're looking at model coherence, particularly around the assumptions that uh, or around those three circles, your, your program will be so much more modally coherent. Simply said, it's something to always remember. The experience for a student with a disability should be the same as any matriculated student. And I refer you back to the movie, Opening Doors to College, which really shows the culture you value to analog. So I want to thank you for listening to this presentation on the theme of model coherency, um, which is one of the themes um, in social role valorization. Thank you.